job training and economic development request for application process. Um, this uh, application was released for 2015, and the good news is we are receiving some additional funding for the JTED program. We're going to get $2.1 million this year compared to $1.7 last year and $1.2 the prior year. So we're excited that um, we have some growth you know, going on in this particular program. Um, basically, what I'm going to do today is share my screen. So if you don't mind being patient with me, I'm going to get to my PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so what we're going to be talking about is the application requirements for the Job Training and Economic Development Grants. And the topics for today, um, we're going to go over the program description, um, what the program requirements are. We're going to talk a little bit about sector strategy initiatives as part of our department's initiatives. Um, we're going to go through the application um, itself, you know, pretty in depth of what I'm, I'm anticipating and what I want to see in it. Um, we'll go over the submission process of, of the forms and then the selection and criteria. And then once we get done with this particular PowerPoint, I'm going to briefly go over a financial PowerPoint. I'm not going to go real in depth with that. Um, basically, I just wanted to share that so that you know on the financial side your financial responsibilities if you're granted this grant and some things that need to be set up. Um, so that's just more information for you to review um, once we go offline, but there's a few key points I want to point out in that PowerPoint. So let's get started. JTED was established, I think, back in about um, uh, 1999. It's been around for quite a few years. We've been funded every year but one. Uh, but basically, the, the intention of JTED is to um, support two different categories or programs. The first category is to foster economic development with low-wage, low-skilled employed individuals who need skill upgrades um, within the workforce. Um, and that's with their local employer um, within that local industry or sector. The second program, which is called Category 2, is to foster local economic development by linking the needs of um, underskilled, unemployed, disadvantaged individuals with the needs of the workforce in that local industry. So Category 2 deals more with um, um, unemployed individuals and getting them the skill sets to be employed with a specific um, sector that you're working with. To be eligible to apply for JTED, you have to be a not-for-profit organization, 501c3. You have to have a local board of directors. You need to have experience in providing job training services. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be the direct training provider, but you at least have to have experiences in, in offering um, employment and training services. And you have to have a history of working with low-wage, low-skilled workers and or disadvantaged population, the un un unemployed, low-skilled population. Okay, we're going to go into the two categories a little bit more to define exactly what they are and what they do. So well, like I said, JTED um, provides funding for two different program categories. You can only apply for one category. You cannot come in for a Category 1 funding and Category 2 funding. So you need to select which, which, which target population you're going to go for and only submit um, a training program for one of the, one of the categories. So like I said, Category 1, um, the, the mission of that is to provide training and employment services to low-wage, low-skilled employed workers, they're called incumbent workers, or newly hired disadvantaged um, person or individuals that are employed by the employer. Um, you work directly with employers to determine training needs and the, employee, and the employee's needs um, that are going to be served. So basically with Category 1, your client is the employer. Um, in, in you know, the, all cases, you have an already established relationship with an employer um, in a specific sector that you're, you know, you're doing your training in. Um, and so your client is the employer. And then the employer will identify the individuals that need specific skill upgrades um, so that they can basically move up the career pathway within that, within that employer. Um, and so it's pretty much the employer selects those individuals that need, that they need the skill upgrades, and the community-based organization works directly with the employer to implement the training services that are needed for that, for that employer. The Category 2, on the other hand, works with unemployed, disadvantaged individuals. And so the client for your Category 2 are more the individuals to be served. You still need to have established employer partnership relationships um, because the end result is these 
individuals that are going to be um, trained need to be placed um, with, them, with the local employers and then, and then need to be retained. So you need to have uh, um, relationships established with employers, and you also need to provide training that is, um, is driven by the employer so that w the curriculum that you're providing is something that the, uh, the sector or the industry um, is in demand for. So it's the employer in centric training, which you know, basically means you're training to meet the employer's specific needs for that, that sector or that employer. Okay, but with JTED, it's a performance-based grant, um, and so allowable expenditures are based upon meeting the negotiated performance measures. And we have five measures. Um, for Category 1, which is your incumbent workers, your measures are entered into training, your midpoint of training, completing training, retained, and a wage benefit increase. Um, for your Category 2, it's the entered in training, midpoint of training, completed training, employed, and retained for 90 days. Um, the midpoint of the training is defined by, by your training program. We have some training programs that may last for 10 months, and we may have some training programs that may last for eight weeks. So the midpoint of the training is, that is def defined locally. It's defined by the organization as what they're, they're considering the midpoint. Um, enrolled in training actually is not just taking an application, but it's actually seat time um, that they started in the program. But um, you know, if they didn't make it to midpoint, then that would be one less number in your midpoint section. But enrolled has to um, actually be seat time and not just that they applied. Um, and then the you know, completion of training, obviously, is when they've completed uh, that particular training. Um, retention, we have 90-day um, retention, that's a required uh, measure, or 150-day non-consecutive. So if they were um, employed for 30 days in one job and then had a gap and then went back, you have to have 150 non-consecutive days of employment. Um, and then your wage and benefit increase, and that is for Category 1 only, that's the incumbent workers. Um, one of the things, um, and this was added a couple years ago because this is an important measure um, that we need to keep, but one of the um, things that we recognize with Category 1, if you're working with, say, a manufacturer and it's like a union position, um, the training does not always have directly affect the wage increase, especially if you're, you're, um, the um, employees are under a contract and they have annual increases. Um, so and that, that is you know, taken into consideration with us. But as long as they're getting a skill upgrade and um, there's, you know, their productivity is better for the employer and that there's a career pathway that they can go up, as long as those things are being met and they are receiving a wage increase within the time period um, you know, of them being served in this program, they can still be counted as a, a successful um, completion. So basically that's um, our performance measures. And we'll get into that a little bit more of how we, that works with the program. Okay, so for pro program category one, low wage, low skilled workers, um, the activities that are allowable under this is um, you're going to partner with your local employers in need of um, skilled workers, better skilled workers. Um, you're going to identify employers, um, employees unable to you know advance in their careers due to inadequate skills. And like I said, the employer will uh, be the case in this, this particular case will be the ones that will identify those employees and then refer them to the program. Um, and an example would be in manufacturing. If you have somebody that's uh, like in doing welding and they want to, they have the capacity and they want to move up to like a CNC operator, um, you can provide training for that um, that individual to get their CNC um, certifications, and then they can move up with that that manufacturer employer uh, to a higher higher level of a job. Um, Development of curriculum and implementation of the, the training is, you know, allowable activities. And then uh, with Category 1 especially, that's done in collaboration with the employer, so you're meeting the specific, you know, curriculum needs of the employer. Um, and then um, with the training implementation, it could be, you know, if you're a, a internal training provider, it could be, you know, at your site. You could be doing training at the employee's site on their machinery. So um, the implementation of it can vary depending upon, you know, or you may be contracting out the training through a community college, um, too. So there's different variables of how it's implemented. But it has to, the employer has to be a, an integral part in that curriculum development and making sure that you're training them for what the employer needs. And then, of course, follow up on the training activities and case management. And, and um, those activities are all allowable because you'll have your case management activities for the, for the um, individuals being trained. And then you also have to do your follow-up for retention. 
what are program outcomes that we're, you know, we hope to obtain um, with Category 1 is increased skill levels of the participants, increased earnings of the participants. Um, we want to be able to provide opportunities for job advancement and the capacity to move up a career ladder, and of course increased capacity and productivity for the employer um, as a result of a better uh, skilled workforce that their productivity um, will also increase in capacity. Um, a big one with this is, is the earnings, you know, the potential for increase in earnings and also the opportunity to um, have advancement, job advancement and to be able to move up a uh, career pathway with that employer. And, um, you know, that's one of the things that um, we encourage with Category 1 people to really work with the employers and develop career pathways uh, within that employer so there is opportunity. To be eligible as a participant to receive training for Category 1, you have, it's, you have to be a low-wage, low-skilled worker, um, and you have to earn an hourly wage um, that's equal to or less than 175 percent of the federal poverty level for a family of three. And with that said, I'm going to go to the next slide. And this shows you what the wage is. So basically, at this point, a client who has an hourly wage of $18.04 or less is eligible to be um, trained under this program. And like I said, it's based on a family size of three. Um, if you look at the family size of three, their annual income for 175% is 34633 dollars and we base that on 1,920 hours um, a year. So that is a, a right around 36 hours um, a week is what we base uh, this income off of. Um, now, for full-time employment in JTED, regardless of your Category 1 or Category 2, you have to be working at least 30 hours a week or more to be considered full-time employment in the JTED program. So when you're, when you're doing your employment measures and your retention measures, um, you have to make sure that that individual is working at least 30 hours a week. Okay, now we're going to move to pro program category two, unemployed disadvantaged individuals. It's similar to category one. The, what, the one difference is your client is the, the, the person being trained. Um, so you're working uh, more directly with the, the individual, and you're doing the outreach and recruitment for those individuals to be trained. Um, you still have to have very strong employer partner relationships and relationships within the industry um, because the end result needs to be that they're placed in, um, in jobs and, and good um, growing um, demand jobs that have growth potential. So you need to have strong employer relationships and you need to know the industry well so that you know what, what is needed as far as the curriculum and the training that's required for these individuals to be placed in those jobs. Um, you're going to assess the, the barriers to the individuals that are unemployed, the disadvantaged population. There could be multiple barriers. Um, they could be, you know, a lot of cases we see, um, you know, homelessness, um, disabilities, um, addictions. Um, there could be, um, you know, problems with uh, criminal records. You made some expungement issues. So, the, you know, in many cases there could be multiple barriers to these individuals for why they're not employed at this time, um, you know, at this time. So you need to assess their barriers. A port of service is available through JTED, but there's not a lot of money in JTED. So you need to have the capacity to know your networks and help um, assist with, um, you know, potentially supportive services or other types of services um, to address some of these barriers to employment. Um, and then the focus, a lot of the focus is, is on the, the actual training itself with JTED. So the development of the curricula and the implementation of the training that meets the needs. And once again, we can say that it has to meet the needs of the employers in the industry um, to, pro to provide those disadvantaged peoples with those required skills. Now with Category 2, it is kind of an entry point um, for employment. And that's the beauty of JTED. There's a lot of programs out there that The, um, the program um, is an entry-level step um, for individuals. So you would see like in the healthcare potential like a, a CNA training, um, which is something that on the WIA program that they, they don't like doing CNA training in the WIA program because it is an entry-level job and they want the higher level, like the LPN, RN type uh, positions. Um, what we would like to see though, uh, with that being said, is you know if you can develop you know, a, a pathway for these individuals. So obviously in the healthcare sector, there's this demand occupations, and that's one of our key sectors. So if they can get the CNA program through the JTED program, and then you can set up relationships, you know, with other service providers, say like the WIA program, where if they have the capacity and the desire and, and the, um, the um, 
they want to transform their lives even more, then they can continue on and they can go to do like an LPN program or an RN program and continue on with that, that pathway and gaining experience and a better job. Okay, so with the outcomes, and I kind of went over that, basically we want to meet the industry needs for the skilled work, increase the skill levels of the participants. We want to place these participants in, um, in the jobs in the industry and train them in. Um, and that's kind of kind of a key sometimes too is that you, we're, we're, if you're training somebody to be a, uh, in the healthcare sector, you don't want to place them in a fast food um, sector. So we're actually training and placing these individuals in the, you know, in the industry, the same industry. Um, participants retention, it's 90 days consecutive or 159 consecutive and you have to um, follow up on those individuals. And then providing opportunity for job advancement and a, a capacity for moving up a career pathway. And like I discussed with the, you know, the CNA example, that they're being placed and have an opportunity and then could potentially be linked with other providers to continue on that career pathway. Okay, for, so, so for Category 2, the unemployed disadvantage, eligible participants, and we use the WIA guidelines, if you're familiar with the WIA program, it's disadvantaged individuals are um, uh, between the age of 16 and 72 and have at least one of the following. So if they um, receive or is a member of a family which receives cash, welfare payments under federal, state, or local welfare programs, um, that would be an automatic qualifier. Um, if you're qualifying them based upon family income, then you have to look at the last six months prior to the application of their family income. And there are some exclusions. Um, and we will go through that, you know, um, once the grantees are selected, we'll have a grantee meeting and we'll go through all of the exclusions. But um, it's basically relates to the family size. So whatever, it cannot exceed 70% of lower living standard income level. And there's a chart I'm going to show. But so basically, if you're, if you're qualifying based upon income, it has to be the family income for the last six months, and it cannot exceed 70% of the um, LLSIL for the family size. And another automatic qualifier is, of course, food stamps. And um, food stamps, if they, if they were receiving food stamps, you just can you know, make a copy of that and include it in a client file, and that's an automatic qualifier. Now, if an individual is um, homeless um, and qualifies under the uh, 103 of the Stuart B. McKinsey Homeless Assistance Act, that's another, another automatic qualifier. And then the last one is if, if there's an individual that's disabled, but they reside, they have a family that they live with whose family income exceeds the allowable income, you can qualify the disabled individual based upon their own income. So you can count them as a family of one. So if you have somebody that's disabled, but the family income exceeds the limit, you can, you can qualify them on their own income as long as it's within the income standard. And this next page gives you the, um, um, the LLSIL. So you'd have to look at what LWIA you reside in. Um, and then from that, then you're going to determine what the family size is, and then from that you will know what their, you know, the, the income level is, the maximum income level for them to qualify for the program. Like I said, once again, this is if you're using income as, an, as the eligibility, and this needs to be documented too, obviously, in the files when you do that. Okay, within DCEO, um, Office of Employment and Training, they have uh, established basically sectors which the state feels are high growth um, sectors and have good jobs. And so we, we really want to push our training efforts to those areas where there is going to be, there is the demand for the job or there is a future demand for the jobs, a near future demand for jobs, and where it's, there are going to be good jobs for these individuals. Um, so with that, we have established um, specific sectors at the state level, and they include healthcare, manufacturing, transportation, distribution, and logistics, information technology, and the agriculture sec um, sectors. Um, local workforce investment areas may also target specific sectors. So an example would be LWIA 7, which is the Chicago area. Um, um, uh, high demand jobs there also include hospitality and food service. Um, so those are, those are some, uh, a sector where there's a lot of, of jobs and, and growth potential in those sectors also for good paying jobs. 
Um, so basically, when you're um, establishing your plan of what you're going to do, your training plan, you want to make sure that you're targeting good paying jobs in growth sectors. Um, and we take a look at that we're, that's weighed in our uh, criteria when we're doing our evaluation that you've, you know, you're doing training in something that, that is uh, a key sector. So I just want to include that in there. Okay, now what we're going to do is actually walk through the application itself, and I'm going to explain exactly, you know, what we want in this application, and um, you know, the specific areas I want to highlight as we go through this. And what I'm going to do at this point, I'm kind of going to jump between my PowerPoint presentation and the actual application, um, because I want to highlight specific things in, that need to be addressed in the application, and then I also want to show you where it's at in the application that you do this. And hold on one second. I'm actually going to have to open this. Sorry, guys. I just stopped my screen for a second. I didn't need to open the my file. is closed, and so I need to open the correct file. Okay. Okay. Um, Lacey, if, if for some reason you don't see this, let me know. Um, I think I have the grant application file up now, though, so hopefully everybody can see this. Um, several years ago, our department went to a common application, so if you've done business with our uh, our uh, department before, let me see here, um, then you know that uh, you know about this application. You're, you're aware of this application. So basically, the first uh, part of it, section one, is just, just general information, you know, the legal name of your organization and address. The chief officer, um, you know, this is, in most cases, should be the, the CEO. And the chief officer, whatever you put in this field, um, is what's going to be the authorized signatory when we put this information in e-grants. And if you worked with us before, you know, anytime we have reports that are due or a modification, an authorized signatory has to sign. So this is what we use for the authorized signatory when we're entering this stuff into e-grants. Uh, but under Section 1, you just kind of work your way through it. It asks for very specific information as far as, you know, your, um, your DUNS number, your fiscal year and dates, um, you know, just different information regarding your organization. If you've had grants with us before, if there's been change of staff, that type of information. What I want to discuss, though, is under 3.3, which is a, a, a brief description of the program. And I'm going to hop back. And right here is where it's at on 3.3, but I'm back to my PowerPoint presentation. And what we want in here, we want something that um, describes the training program be provided. I want it to be concise but descriptive. Uh, it's something that you could share with the general public. So if you had to tell somebody what your program is that knew nothing about it, um, you could write it in a way so they understood what, exactly what you were doing. Um, you know, your intent defined and something that if I wanted to, I could pull this out of, out of your application and use it as a part of your scope of work. So if we select you as a grantee, then I can pu pull that right out of your application and put it in your scope of work. So it needs to be concise and descriptive. Um, if I was going to share this with a legislator and they wanted to know what, what kind of program you were planning on doing, I could take that and, and give that to them. And um, it would be a pretty good description. But it also, like I said, it needs to be concise because the application itself, um, it has 550 characters. So I don't want a, a volume in there, but you know, just a, you know, a paragraph, but concise. If you're doing more than one program, and we'll get into this a little later on, say you are doing a, want to um, fund a CNA program and say you want to do a transportation program, you know, a truck driver program, describe both of them, you know, both of the different program, the training programs that you're offering, um, but once again, keep it concise. So, and in this application, um, under 3.8, it's um, funds requested from DCEO. This amount should correlate with, what, what, with what's in your budget, so just make sure that you're your financial numbers are all um, in line, and they add to the same thing in the different parts of the budget. Uh, 
Uh, but just high-level task with this once again. And I'm going to pop back over here and give you, um, we have the PowerPoint along with the, um, you can look at the PowerPoint presentation when you download along with the, the application when you're filling it out. And basically what I said did was I just highlighted some you know, key things in each of these sections. So, and this is just an, this is just an example. So for your task, you know, identify um, employer partners. You know, by what data are you going to have your employer partners identified? Um, by what data are you going to have the, um, your participant population that you're going to serve identified? Um, by what day are your cohorts going to be completed? If you have you know, two cohorts, you know, cohort one will be completed by this date, cohort two by this date. Um, you know, all training completed. If you know, um, and placement. When do you anticipate having all of your placements completed? Stuff like that. Just a high level. I mean, this is just an example. So like I said, so um, don't use my stuff verbatim, but high level um, of of what your tasks are going to be. So, and then in the next section, let me pop back here to the application again. It's like I said, I'm sorry I'm bouncing back and forth, but I want to show you each section and what's important in each. So that was scope of four, the scope of work. And then section five is the performance measures section. And you see here we have all of the measures here. And I'm going to pop back to my PowerPoint and explain exactly what we want, what we want there. And we attribute that amount to each of the measures. So in that second column where it says 20% of requested funds, $20,000 is attributed to each one of the, the uh, measures. And in the first column, I'm saying how many people I anticipate training in each of those measures, or you know, how many will accomplish each of those measures. So the number enrolled, I have 50, you know, 47 for completing midpoint, 44 for completing training, 39 to be employed, and then 35 retained for 90 days or greater. Um, so I take that 50 and divide it into the uh, 20,000. It gives me 400. So that is my attributed. I'm oh, sorry about that. Switch screens. That is my attributed cost um, per person for that measure. Um, so there are basically two ways that you can have disallowed costs to this grant. One is if you don't make performance. The other is if you don't spend your money or if you don't spend your money appropriately and and um, what's allowed with the grant. So an example would be. Um, if our contract was negotiated and you plan on having 35 retained, and at the end of the two years, when the grant's closing, you only you only um, retained 34, then you would owe $571 back to the department. So um, the great thing about JTED is it's not really heavy on the administrative side. We don't require a lot administratively, but we also have a hook because it is a performance-based grant. So the department has a little bit of a hook so that if you don't make performance, then um, you know, there's, there's some costs that, are, that come back to our department. So it's kind of a win-win, really, for both of us. We try to make it a, a, an easy administrative grant, but we also um, you know, want to make sure that you're accomplishing what you say you're going to accomplish. So that is the performance section. Um, and then we get into the budget. Um, and in the budget, um, we have these different cost categories that you're going to explain how you're going to spend the money. Now, the performance measures was your, this, this was telling us who, how you're going to serve, who you're going to serve, and in what measures. And then this is telling us how you're going to spend it. So um, we have um, providers in the past that have actually been the training providers. They are training facilities. So under your personnel cost, um, if you are your own training provider, then you will have your personnel um, costs for training instructor. And once again, I'm sorry, advanced. Um, you'll have the training instructor salary. You could have case manager salary, um, uh, job coach, job retention. Um, you know, you have people that uh, working with the employers. So those types of, of individuals on your staff would be under the, the personnel. And then the fringe benefits that's attributed to those dollars charged to the grant is the second one. So personnel is your staff um, that's, that's directly involved with these clients and providing services, whether it be through case management, through job development, um, or through you know, instruction, direct instruction. That's what goes in there. Um, travel, if you have you know, some travel costs you know, associated with going to work sites or whatever, you know, that's 
That's obviously what that would be for. Now, equipment, we've never had equipment in JTED, but there's not enough money to really support large equipment purchases. And equipment is usually defined 5000 and over. So, I mean, we've never, we've never approved a budget for equipment. And I, it should probably be eliminated from our budget line item, but it's, it's there. If you have a very, very, very good justification, we might consider, because it's not disallowed, but it's just something that we've, we've not done. So um, supplies, once again, if you need specific supplies for the training, you know, um, that's where you would in, um, include that and your, you know, along with the training supplies. Um, space costs, so if you are your um, own provider, um, you know, your classroom costs would be associated with that. You know, your costs for, you know, your case managers, the space costs for the case managers, job developers, those types of things would be included in your, your space cost. Now, contractual direct training would be if, um, if you're not directly providing the training and you're contracting out with a community college, then that's where that would fall under. So whoever is doing the training, if you're contracting with somebody else to do the training, then you're going to put that in that amount. And then your contractual other, if there's any other contractual services that you're offering, um, you know, um, the audit could fall under that because that's a contracted service. But if there's any other services that you are contracting out, you know, job developer or something like that, I haven't really seen much of that. But if, if that's a contracted service, you'd have to show that there. And then under other, it's kind of a catch-all. Um, with other, you know, you can put your administrative costs, and it cannot be more than 10% of the total grant amount. So, and that would include your, your accounting, you know, um, your fiscal office, your, you know, director. So it's your overhead costs, basically, um, will fall under other, and that cannot exceed 10%. And then also under other, um, any supportive services that you're going to be providing for the, the, the clients, if they would need, say, transportation costs or if they would need some child care costs, keep in mind there's not a lot of money in JTED. Um, so you don't want to eat up a whole lot of other organizations you can refer them to for those services, that's, that's optimal. Um, but if, you know, for an example, if you needed um, a stethoscope or something for your clients and you're doing a CNA class, that, that type of stuff is allowable. Um, and you can put that under other. Um, just keep it in mind with, with your budget, you know, and the limitations on the budgets. And then the next section is your, um, um, de uh, actually details your costs. So under the cost justification, um, you want to have detail as far as what those costs are attributed to. So for like your personnel, if say you're, you have three people, you have um, the program director, you have a case manager, and you have a, tr a trainer. Um, you want to indicate all three of those positions as the detail. You want to indicate the amount of their FTE that they're you know, on that and what's being paid uh, out of the JTED grant for those positions. So be detailed as far as how, you know, what, is, what is personnel, what are, you, what are the charges, and how did you come up with that amount um, that you're charging off for personnel. And then obviously your fringe benefit, what percent are you charging for fringe benefit and what, what, are, you, what are you offering, you know, FICA, uh, Workman's Comp. Um, you know, what, what all are your benefits that you're charging off to this grant? Um, your travel, once again, don't just put, you know, 500 bucks travel detail saying, you know, this is for trips, you know, for the job developer or trips for, you know, whoever's going to need those costs and, and then what, what the costs are associated with, whether it be mileage costs, um, you know, that type of information. So be, you know, somewhat detailed on that. Equipment, I'm not going to worry about because, like I said, we really don't do equipment. And then de supplies, be detailed on your supplies, too. Just don't, don't say $1,000 supplies. Kind of detail what your supplies are going to be, what you anticipate needing under your supplies category. And then same, same way with your space costs. You know, how did you come up with that dollar amount, you know, that you're attributing to space costs? And then contractual direct, you know, if you're, somebody's, you're contracting with a community college, who is the community college and how much are you paying them? Um, same way with contractual other services. And then under other, we definitely want you to detail if, if you have administration costs that you're putting in there, you know, indicate, you know, administration, but it can't be any more than 10%. If you're going to do any um, supportive services for the clients, if you're going to be, um, you know, doing transportation for the clients, indicate what it is and how you came up with that figure. So be de if you're going to have other costs, make sure that you explicitly explain what those are. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is kind of jump back so you can see what we went over in the actual application itself. We talked about the performance measures. Under Section 6A, current employment level, 
complete this, but this deals with your organization. So it's number of permanent, full-time individuals currently employed by the applicant. So how many people are full-time that work for your organization? How many people are part-time that work for your organization? That should be a relatively simple number to get. Uh, but go ahead and complete that part. We have a Section 6B in Projected Employment Impacts for FTE Value Table. This, this don't worry about filling out. Uh, this is something that is uh, more relevant for other grants that our department does. And so um, this section we don't evaluate at all in your application. Um, if you put numbers in there, that's fine. We're not going to look at them anyway. <laughs> but um, 6B is something that we just don't really evaluate for this particular grant, as is 6C. 6C is projected construction jobs impact. So this is talking about number of individuals that have been hired for construction jobs, and it's not relative to what we're doing. So 6C is, is, does not have to be completed. And then here is Section 7 is what um, we discussed already as far as your costs, and this is where you're going to input the information. If you have matching funds, please enter those in also. Uh, matching funds is um, graded. It's, it's points are added for um, Category 1 grantees that have matching funds. It's not graded with Category 2, but it still is a good idea if you do have other resources to let us know what those are. And then under Other here, you can detail each of your other costs. So, and then once again, like I said, here's the, the program summary. So you're going to actually be more descriptive narratively of how you came up with the cost, say, in personnel here. You know, this, this part down here is going to tell you exactly what that is. Okay, now we're going to go into the program-specific information. Um, let me snap back to my PowerPoint. Okay, now under the program specific information, the first thing you're going to do is tell us about your organization. So we asked for organization's experience, uh, provide a description of your organization's mission, um, your experience in providing employment training services, identify your key personnel and the qualifi qualifications to administer the program. You're going to indicate the number of um, participants that your organization serves altogether and your annual budget so we have an idea of the, the size and volume of your organization. Um, with this, also, what we need for you to do as an attachment is include your not-for-profit certification, your board list, Secretary of State Certificate of Good Standing. You can go to the Secretary of State site and you can click Certificate of Good Standing and you can print it from right there. You can order a certificate, but we don't need that. We just, you can just print it right off Secretary of State site. And the W-9 form. And the W-9 is needed if you're a new grantee to us. That's needed to send to the Comptroller's Office if, if you're determined to be funded. So those are attachments that need to be um, included with this. And we'll go, I'll go into how I want those included in a bit. But just give us a description of your organization, you know, a summary of what your organization is and how you feel like you qualify for this program. Under the next section, you're going to identify the industries, occupations, and skills um, that you're targeting for this training. So with Category 1, once again, you're working directly with the employer. and um, you're working with the employer to develop curriculum and skills that the employer specifically needs for his employees. So you have to define those, what those skill deficiencies are for that occupation um, in conjunction with the employer. Um, and you, you need to um, address what the potential is for wage rate increases and what the potential is for career pathway movements of that. So we want to know basically um, what the role of the employer is in assessing the employee's skill needs, um, you know, the developing of the curriculum, coordinating the training with, you know, with the employers, uh, and their commitment to retaining and promoting, you know, these individuals that you've trained. Um, and, and with that, what is the potential of them being able to move up a career pathway with that employer? Now, for Category 1, um, it's through um, the legislation, um, it's been limited to employers who have less than 250, 250 or less full-time employees um, at their site. So an example uh, is we have organizations that's worked with the Hilton hotels before. Now obviously Hilton, um, you know, hotels that employs, you know, many, many, many people. But the specific site, you know, that they're working with, they may be working with a specific hotel in an area, and they may only have 150 employees at that site. Well, that site would qualify. You could work with that site. Um, but if you're working with a manufacturer and this manu ABC Manufacturing has 500 people at that site, then they would not qualify. So it has to be with an employer that has 250 um, or fewer 
full-time employees. Um, if, if they have more than that, then you cannot offer um, um, services with that employer for their, for their employees. So that's something that you know has been discussed. If that needs to be changed in the future, but at this point we we are still with the 250. Okay, for category two um, under this um, section that we're discussing the the identifying targeted industries and occupations and skill deficiencies. Um, you're still going to want to identify the industries and occupations the training will be provided in, identify um, skills employers need, and that the disadvantaged population lacks. So what are the skills that the employers need that the, these people don't have that you need to train for? Um, what are the barriers to employment for the disadvantaged population? And what is the availability of uh, positions and the wage rate? So once again, when you're identifying and targeting industries, occupations, and skill deficiencies, you want to make sure that you're targeting ones that are in you know, growth jobs that have um, good jobs um, and positions you know, now or near in the future that these people can be placed in. So that is the information that we want to have under identifying, how you're identifying those, those targeted industries, occupations, and what the skill deficiencies are that you're going to be um, training for. OK, the next section, we want to know um, what the employer's role in planning, training, placement, and promotion and retention is. So for category one, um, since the relationship is with the employer, what is the, the uh, role of the employer in assessing the employees that need the skill upgrade? So how are they selecting the, their employees to, to participate in this program? Um, what, how are you guys developing training curriculum together, together and coordinating the training? Um, and what is their commitment to the retention and promotion of these employees? So uh, that's the information we want to know on the employer's role for your category one. For category two, uh, we want you to describe, once again, the relationship between the CBO and the employers and the role the employer is going to place in, in curriculum development again and in assisting in the training and providing job opportunities after the training. So what, what, is, what are they going to do? Are they going to be giving these people jobs? You know, what, is the, what is the opportunity for these people to be placed with these employers? Um, and then the retention and promotion aspects of that too. So basically, we want to make sure that the, the employers are vested in this program also along with you. Um, if you can, if you have employer partnerships that you or uh, partnership agreements, that's good to include. So um, if your agreements that you have with employers, you can in include those as an as an attachment. They need to be timely. Don't include like a partnership agreement that you've had with an employer that's dated back in 2010. It needs to be you know something that's timely. Um, you know, as far as an agreement is concerned. So, um, and that's what we're looking for under under the employer role for um, planning and training and placement. And then our next section, we describe local partnerships, and we have employer partnerships. Now, the way this is different from the one above it is um, we want to know a pro the process of getting employers on. So during the whole time for category category one and category two, you may have new employers coming in, and you may have employers that drop off. So what is your process for that pipeline of employers to make sure that you have um, working relationships with enough employers in that sector that these individuals are going to have good jobs when they come out? And how are you developing that pipeline of employers um, so that you are continually you know, adding employers, and you will, and you will drop some off too, so that you know you continually have that that pool of employers that these individuals can be placed with. Um, we also want to know um, if you're working with any local economic development or um, sector representatives, or if you have a training provider that's working with you. Um, what what they're bringing to the table? What are, what are they doing to help with this? So um, on this particular section under describing local partnerships, you're going to want to define the relationship with those organizations. And then if you have any partnership agreements with them, also include those. So if you are contracting with a community college, what's their role and what are they going to do? And I'm going to jump to the application again so we can kind of you know, visually see where this is at that we've discussed. So in the application, we talked about the organization experience, identifying the targeted industries and occupations, the employer role in planning, placement, and training. And then what we just discussed was the employer partnerships. Um, and then that is you know, how you're keeping that pipeline of employers. And then the, um, your other partnerships. OK, now we're actually going into the training program format now. Now you could have more than one training program. Um, in very different sectors. So you might 
um, be offering a training program in healthcare, and you may also be offering a training program in transportation. Uh, if you have two very distinct training programs, you will need to fill out more than one training program format. If your training is pretty concise, I mean, if you can keep it all in one training program format and it's in the same sector, then that, that's, that's fine. Um, you just need to be detailed. We do have you know, some grantees that serve multiple sectors, but the training program itself is, is pretty concise and consistent with all of those. Um, so they can, they can fill out just one training program format. Um, but if you fill out more than one training program format, you need to make sure you're going to put your enrollments, midpoint, completion, employed, and retained, and, and wage increase for each of the training program formats. If you have more than one, then those numbers should total to the, the benchmark numbers, which, let me go up to that screen. Uh, da, 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 da. Which is in Section 5, Performance Measures. So under enrollment, if you're doing a CNA program and you're planning on training, say, 20, and then you're doing a truck driving program and you're doing 30, that's 50 total. So 50 would be enrolled in the training program under Section 5. That's your cumulative number um, of people that you're going to be training. And then under each of the program-specific training formats, then you're going to tell us, OK, 20 are going to be in CNA. And then you're going to indicate, you know, that your training program site, you know, name is certified nurse assistant, you know, whatever your training program is, the sector that's going to be trained in, and then those enrolled. So, and then you're going to summarize the training program. So this is, you know, if you have um, separate training programs, you're going to summarize them each, each of them individually here. And I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint so we can discuss the specific things that we want there. This is a section I just showed you there where you're going to do your, your, um, your specific training programs. OK, under your summary of the training program, once again, be concise. Um, describe the training program um, concisely, but descriptive. Um, how um, is it going to meet the local industry needs for skilled employees? If you have a specific geographic area that you're targeting, what is that geographic area um, that you're going to be you know, serving? Um, is there a specific population that you're serving? Are you serving homeless? Are you serving disabled? Uh, are you serving um, ex ex cons convicts? What is that population that you're serving? If you're if it's going to be specifically you know targeted, um, and then what is your intended outcome um, for this training program? And once again, this can be concise. It doesn't have to be you know pages of information. Just concise, but into the point. And that's basically a summary of the program. So once again, if I was going to give somebody um, this information that didn't know anything about your, your program, you know, if it's a CNA program, this is what it is. The next thing is you're going to actually get into more of the meat of it. So you're going to describe the activities um, that are going to be offered through this training. So you're going to describe you know, what the training materials are and how they are, they're relevant to the industry. Um, the method of training, um, to include who's providing the training. Is it an in, in-house in training? You know that's being provided. Is it a certified you know training? Um, is it done through a community college? You know how's the training going to be provided? You know the type of training is you know are you doing like a um, is it classroom training? You know any apprenticeship stuff? OJTs? Um, vocational? Is is it going to be a blend of you're going to do some classroom and some um, you know like on the job training? Um, we do not do paid work experience out of this grant, so you can't pay wages for the the participants. Um, but you know you can you can do like an OJT um, type of a training. Um, where will they be trained? Is it going to be like I said on site? Is it going to be you know at the employer's uh, place? Where is it going to ha take it, um, take place at? You know duration of the training. Are they going to receive any credentials or certifications as a result of it? And then what the, what are the outcomes of the training um, long term? Are the particip participants going to be able to move up a career pathway? Um, this would be a good, good place where if you have some other relationships, if you um, are doing like a CNA program, um, but then you have uh, other relationships like with WIA where you can make that transition so that they can be, get their CNA through JTED and then be transitioned to WIA for like maybe an LPM program. Um, that type of information would be good to, put, to be put in this section. And then once again, if they're going to be co-enrolled, um, you know, we need to know that they're going to be co-enrolled in you know, another program. JTED you know, is not... Uh, 
a big enough program financially wise that it can it can necessarily take care of all costs. So in many cases they are co-enrolled. Um, the thing that needs to be um, taken care of on that is your financial. You need to keep your finances separate so that there's not duplicative payments and that it's very clear what who, what program is paying for what costs. Okay. The next section we're going to go into is the um, occupation summary. So what I want you to do here is list the occupations you're training for, the existing wage rate, and the duration of the training. So um, we're going to be doing this 20 hours a day for eight weeks. Um, and then the average cost per participant. Now this average cost needs to be the cost of, of the actual training, regardless of JTED's paying it all or not. So an example would be if you're doing a CNA training. What is the cost for that CNA training? Um, is it you know, 2500 3000 3500 what, what is the true cost for that training? Not just what JTED's paying for it, because if you're, if you're co-enrolling and supplementing the program, JTED may be paying a smaller portion of that. So we just want to know, okay, for, for this training, this is what it's costing us. And then you can have multiple applications. You just have to um, return down to add more things in the file, and we'll go through that. Okay, we want you to list your employer partners, um, the occupations that you're training for for that employer, and if there's an employer match, and it could be in-kind or cash match, either way. Um, and this is something we definitely look at. We want to see, we don't, you know, when you, if you put to be announced or something, we're, we're a little skeptical on that if you don't have employer partnerships already established. So we strongly encourage that you have employer partners. And then the same way below, you're going to list your other partners. If you have, um, if you're working work with a local union, if you're working, if you're contracting out with a training provider, who are they, and are they providing any um, type of a partner match to this for this program? So, and just to kind of summarize, we kind of went through this. Um, your performance measures once again. There's five benchmarks um, um, to track, you know, participant performance. And the enrollment, midpoint, and completion, and retained are benchmarks for all both categories. Employed is for category two, and wage or benefit increases for category one. Um, that summary page, though, the, the performance measure page that we went through, that's where we're going to you know, take a look at your average cost and everything with that. And like I said, once this is negotiated, if you do not meet a performance measure, then that could potentially be disallowed cost to your grant based upon not meeting performance. Okay, for your cost, like I said, Category 1 um, priority is given if you have matching costs. So if you are a Category 1 grantee, we like to see a match. And there are you know, additional points given if you have uh, matching funds for Category 1. Um, once again, 20%. Deobligation at the end of the year is based on, like I said, disallowed costs due to misperformance or unallowable expenditures. And. That's pretty much it for the application itself. I'm going to get back in here. Um, as you see, this, this is where the occupation summary is. Um, I did have some information. If you needed to add more occupations, you just have to enter, enter your enter key. Oops. And then you have to make sure that your information aligns. It's kind of a difficult form sometimes because it is protected. So um, you just need to use your enter key if you're going to add more stuff in each one of these columns. Um, obviously, you can use your delete key if you're going to delete and you don't want that in there. And then you use your tab key to tab through each of the sections. And that's how you complete those specific sections. If you have any problems with completing or filling out the form, just please you know, give me a call and I can work you through that. And then section nine, of course, is the applicant um, certification. Um, in the downloads, there is an applicant certification form that's by itself. Um, when you submit this application, and we're going to go through this um, in a little bit, but we, you're going to submit it as a document. And then the application signature page, you're going to submit separately as a signature document. But we'll go through that here in just a second. OK, selection criteria. We have a team that is uh, from DCEO. Oh, I'm sorry. I started from the beginning. Let me get back to my screen. But we, um, we have a DCO um, team that reviews these applications. And I'm going to get to our selection criteria here. Just one sec.
And since this is a competitive-based grant, you know, we, we judge it based upon criteria. So if you are an existing JTAG grantee or prior grantee, we look at past performance. And that is one thing that's weighed um, during our selection process. Um, we're going to look at the CBO's experience with you know, serving the, the type of population, whether it's um, incumbent worker, low-wage, low-skilled, or unemployed disadvantaged. We're going to look at the qualifications of the people assigned to um, run this program and the qualifications of your organization, basically. Um, we're going to look at the level of employer participation. This is a big one. We want to make sure that you have employers um, that are participating and that you have employers to um, actually for placements once the training is completed. Um, matching funds. Um, it, matching funds is weighed for Category 1. Um, category 2, it's not weighed, but we do like to see some matching funds with that too. So if you do have funds to match, please include those in there. You know, definitely we're going to look at the quality of the curriculum and the training materials. Um, that's a big part of it. Um, we want to make sure that you're training in a, a job demand sector um, that's got, you know, good paying jobs, that's got a career pathway, um, and that the curriculum, you know, seems to be relevant for, for um, the industries that you're training in. Um, obviously, the likelihood of the training resulting in retention and increased earnings. Um, so that's once again talking about your training for industry demand, and it's going to be in-demand jobs um, that have career pathways. Your reasonableness of the cost for the proposal. Um, you know, if, if your costs are extremely high, you know, that's something that we will take into consideration. Costs can be different. You know, there's some organizations that have a longer training program, so their average cost is higher compared to some organizations that have a shorter training program. So all of that's evaluated based upon the actual training itself and the duration of the training. Um, and is it reasonable, you know, in other programs, like in the WIA program and other things that we look at, is the cost seem reasonable? Um, and once again, targeting regional identified demand occupations, industries, and sectors um, that are experiencing critical skill shortages. So are you, are you training in areas where there's, there's a need? And then support letters. If you have letters, you, once again, from employers or you know, good support letters, um, letters from if you have training providers um, from them. Um, you know, if you, a letter from the local workforce investment area showing that you, you know, can, will, can partner with them and they could potentially be your pipeline for moving these people on. You know, once they get training from you, they could potentially go to other providers and receive additional training to upgrade their skills. Okay, this grant is going to start June 1st of 2015 and it will be for two years, so it will go through May 31st of 2017. Um, for new grantees, I always get this question. They say, what is the, the, the funding range? We do not have a maximum or a minimum that we put out there. What I can tell you is we have uh, $2.1 million that's going to be awarded. And we fund anywhere from 18 to 25 organizations each year. And in the past, we've f funded as little as, say, 25000 up to maybe about 150000 So for new grantees in the past, traditionally, we've started them um, at $50,000. Um, now, it doesn't necessarily mean that if, you, if we have an application that comes in that has, just knocks it out of the park that we won't, you know, give them more than $50,000, but that's been traditionally, um, you know, where we've been at with um, new grantees. So I just tell people, keep it realistic. You know, we have $2.1 million, so don't come in asking for a million dollars because it's, that's just not realistic. Um, so keep it realistic in your scope of what you can do and in line with what, you know, we have available. And, and like I said, we, we traditionally, it could, you know, with 2.1 million, I'm anticipating it will be in the 20s, the number of grantees that we, we, we support. Um, you need to submit the budget for the same time period, and then there will be quarterly report, reports that will be due, um, you know, obviously once we get this, this rolling. So you have to have the capacity to, to meet our reporting requirements. For the review and selection, when the, grant, um, the applications come in, I do an initial review. What I do is look and make sure that it's a complete application. Um, I'll look and see that you're in good standing with Secretary of State with the, the attachments that you provide, um, that, you know, that you qualify, you're a 501c3, that you know, you're eligible to apply. Um, if you have a grant with us in, in, with DCEO and other things, if you're on a fiend lock, we'll look at that. It doesn't necessarily mean anything because it may just mean that you have a report that's late. Um, and it, it could be something that's very minor, that's the, why you're under a fiend lock. But if it's something that's significant, then that will play into the factor of whether your grant or your application has moved on to the next level. So we do a, pri you know, a preliminary review for all the applications. Um, and then a team does the, the competitive you know, scoring review. 
um, and that's completed by DCA workforce development staff, and it's presented to you know the director for final recommendations. Um, we presentation we, we say presentations may be required. That just leaves it open if we want some additional information. Um, it's a pretty tight process, so we usually don't come back and ask for presentations. But that's an option if we if we want some more information. Um, and then once we make these selections, you know the final uh, people will be contacted, and then we'll do final negotiations because we usually don't give you what you requested. Um, so in most cases, we have to go back and renegotiate your performance numbers and your budget. And no cost can be incurred in this grant until you have a grant, ex execute a grant agreement with us, unless you have a written consent from our department. So do not incur any cost on this grant until you have an executed grant agreement from us. Um, the applications are due um, January 28th. And we need three originals, or an original and three copies sent to the department. And that information is there in the documents. And then I also need the electronic application sent to me at tammy.stone.illinois.gov. Um, the information that I need with the electronic submittal, and I'm going to go into change my screen here again. And I'm going to have to open a file here real quick. This is just basically the instructions. And this is a, one of the files that's attached. And it was emailed out with the, the, um, the notification, too, if you receive that. And this will be posted on the DC. It's posted on the DCO website and will be posted on Illinois WorkNet also. So, But what I want to take you to here is our application format. Okay, what I anticipate getting from you guys, if you look at application format, is all applications must be submitted in the format prescribed. The template is application name, that's in parentheses, dash 2015 JTED application period doc. Uh, that's the application that we were looking at. That's what you're going to be filling out. When it's completed, you need to, or prior to, whatever you want to do, you need to change the applicant name to your organization name. So this right here is going to be changed to your organization name. And then you keep the 2015 JTED application. And once you're done and it's saved and it's ready to be submitted, you submit it as a Word document. We don't, I don't want it submitted as a, a PDF. This needs to come to me as a Word document. Because then we take information out of that and put it into a, an access database. And this is how we share it with the review team um, you know, and um, other, other individuals that want to see. So it's basically a way for us to get summary documentations of everything. Along with that document, that, that um, Word document you're sending, there's another one. It's the application um, uh, signature page. And so that's basically the last page of the application. It's the signature page. So you need to have your um, CEO sign that and date it. And, and then you can submit that as a PDF file. So just rename applicant name to your organization name again. And then keep the file. Um, I think I had to shrink the name for this webinar because the file sizes can't exceed 50. So I think it says applicant signature page. If you got it through my email, it says applicant certification signature page. Either way, it's the same thing. Um, so you just need to submit it, change your, your applicant name to your agency name, and then have um, um, have well have it signed um, by the, the grants by your CEO, and then submit it with this this formatting. So you're going to have your agency name along with um, you know, applicant certification signature page, um, dash 2015 you know, JTED. That's the way we want to see it. So that way we can keep the files very distinct and we know, we know what belongs with who. And then the, the third and last thing that um, should be coming in is your attachments. Now, um, my preference is that all attachments are in one file. So you would have like a cover sheet saying these are the attachments, and then you know, A, B, C, D, E, F. So you're going to have your um, um, your not-for-profit status, your, your um, board list, you're going to have your um, Secretary of State's good standing, um, support letters, um, employer letters. So whatever you want to provide to us, if you want to add resumes, that you can add resumes, that's fine too. Whatever you think is important for us to make our decision that you think is significant that's not in the application, you can add as an attachment. Um, and like I said, if you if you add three or four attachments, you know, that's fine too. My my personal preference is one attachment with a, a cover page that indicates what each attachment is. Um, um, that's that's where you can add your additional information. You know, if you want to add some information, somebody asked about success stories. If you want to put a success story in, um, that's fine. You know, you can do that. The biggest 
majority of the points are going to come from your application. But this is going to be supportive documentation. If there's anything else that you want us to know that you can you know, get in that, in that application. So that's the way it's supposed to be presented to us. Um, so I'm looking at at least three files that are going to come in. One of them is going to be your application as a Word document. One's going to be the signature page as a CD, uh, PDF that is actually, that's signed by your, your CFO. And then the third is going to be your attachments. And once again, this information needs to be submitted by um, um, January 28th, um, close of business. And then the time period is going to be from June 1, 2015 to May 31, 2017 is what this grant's going to cover the period. So okay, with all that being said, let's go back to the webinar. And let's see if we have any questions. Let me see if I can get back to it. Hold on one second. Stop sharing. Here we go. Okay. Um, if you want to add, some, you know, if you have any questions, let's see here in your chat box. Let's see here. Okay, does anybody have any questions out there regarding what we've gone over so far? Most of this is just dealing with the documents. Okay, there's one additional thing that I want to take you to, and I'll be very brief on this. Um, it's a financial presentation, and this is something that we will be working with with our grantees once they're selected. And um, this spring, we'll have a grantee orientation um, that will go over the procedures and fiscal responsibility and reporting and all of that information. But I just wanted to share this with you so that you know that this is part of your responsibility if you're selected. So let me get back into sharing my screen. And I'm going to open the, the fiscal presentation. Okay, and like I said, I'm just briefly going to go over, I'm going to highlight a few things that I think are key in this. This is for your information that this is required as, as um, having a grant with us. So we have audit requirements, fund accountability, fiscal reporting requirements, if you're subgranting what those requirements are, your internal controls, expenditures for, um, of the funds, allowable costs, budget variance, program income, and monitoring is all discussed in this document. Um, the things that I want to just kind of pull out here, first of all, is fund accounting. Um, you do have to submit, uh, it's called a department um, DCO grantee report. And with that, you need to submit a trial balance. So you need to be able to have um, fund-based accounting in your system. So when you submit a trial balance, you can submit a trial balance for this fund, um, which will show the revenue and expenditures for this fund and not like uh, the entire agency's trial balance. So this is an example. It's a very um, easy example of a trial balance. But if you received $100,000 in grant funds, um, you know, you show the, the grant revenue and then you have your, your line items of, you know, your expenditures, your revenue and expenditures on this. Um, and this will correlate with your budget that we will negotiate. So those, the line items in your budget, your trial balance should correlate with that or you need to be able to do a crosswalk for me so I understand how your trial balance ties to the budget line items that you said that you were going to spend your money on. Um, we're going to skip over, like I said, all, this is just information for you to go through if you're going to do subgrantees, your internal controls. I'm going to breeze through this information here. Um, your procedures manual, um, you should have a fiscal procedures manual, and these are items that should be included in your procedures manual. So take a look at this and make sure that you have these um, um, items addressed in your fiscal procedures manual. Um, you, you know, expenditures of funds obviously has to be in line with what is in the scope of work and allowable in the grant. Um, and then one, another thing I want to talk about is like um, cost out, um, allowability, things that are not allowed um, or any unnecessary costs you know, are prohibited. You know, any food, alcohol, entertainment expenses are prohibited. Gifts, donations, fundraising, promotional materials. 
fines, penalties, interest costs, that's all prohibited. Um, you can do like uniforms and tools if, or um, supportive services if it's um, required for employment. So there are, um, you can do supportive services that they are allowable. Just keep in mind that it's, um, it's limited funding and supportive services can, can eat up a budget you know, pretty quick too depending upon what, what kind of supportive services you're um, offering. Um, costs um, may be disallowed if they're duplicates of costs incurred for clients who are co-enrolled in more than one program. So if you're paying for the same cost out of two different um, grant funds, then there would be disallowed costs associated with that. So that's another reason you need to keep your funds separate and so you can distinguish who's paying for what. Um, once again, you can go through this arms sleek bargaining agreement and com um, competitive cost allocation plans, budget variances. Um, and we do not put, um, well, actually we do have a budget variance because what we do with this grant, when we put it in our accounting system, we put, the, put it in according to our measures. So when we put the information in, you earn this money based upon your measures and accomplishment of your measures. So we, um, our, our budget is put in based upon that needs to be expended first. Um, so that does not come back at the end of the grant. If you have interest that's been shown as unexpended, then that has to be returned. So make sure you expend your interest or income. Um, and that's pretty much it. It just talks about some monitoring. So it, this pretty much concludes our presentation. Let me get back, stop sharing my screen. And is there any questions at all from anybody? Um, we will send out an email that's going to give you the links to the DCEO website and, and the um, Illinois WorkNet site where this information will be posted. The PowerPoint will be posted along with all of the documents. Um, and so we'll send that link to you. So if, if you can't access them here for some reason, it will be available to you through those links. And let me just go through and see if there's any other questions that we have outstanding. I think we've got everything addressed. So thank you, everyone, for participating. I hope I answered all your questions. Um, and once again, if you have any questions, you can give me a buzz. I can answer general questions regarding the application. I can't do anything specific as far as your design or development, but I can you know, answer general questions. So